recording the meeting and we're recording that video so we got two cameras going and we got this recorded so nice complicated setup <laughs> so uh let's see which camera will i look at while i intro the show hey out there this is matt ready um let me do that again if I try. all right hey out there this is uh matt ready host of the mindful activist uh Founder of the Global Consensus Project, author of the book Revolutionary Mindfulness, um, and developer of the Hive1.net software. I'm also an elected politician. I'm a hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. And uh, today we have uh, an activist on this joining me on the show, and whoever else decides to drop in on the show, if anyone does that. Um, Eric Miller is here, uh, who I have. I met very briefly in Olympia. Um, it was one of the organizers uh, for a healthcare rally on the steps of the, I guess, the legislative building down there. And uh, he was kind of the MC of the event and did a really good job. Uh, very, you know, very funny and comfortable um, and inspiring and kept the event going. So, and, uh, you know, allowed me to speak or invited me to speak there. So that was cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so other than that, we don't know each other very well, so we're going to be getting to know each other during this uh, this episode. Uh, so thanks for watching. Feel free to uh, post a question or comment in Facebook Live, um, and there's a chance we'll notice it. I'm not really going to be watching that, um, but if you go to the Hive, um, the Hive link. I will be watching that where people can post uh, any sort of comments or questions about the um, show. And that reminds me, I have one more link to post and then we're going to start talking. Um, the challenge of doing the technical stuff while you're actually also hosting the show. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing good. How are you doing today? I am pretty good. I haven't done a show for a few weeks so you know i'm getting back into the swing of it yeah it's been a while since i've been on uh anything either yep. i it's always fun though all right so let's uh so let's start with uh so i, I described you as an activist but do you, how would you want to um introduce yourself to the universe of you know the millions of people that will watch this show someday I, I, just, <laughs> I, just, I just like to think of myself as uh, a defender of those who aren't normally defended. I think that would be the, uh, the simplest way to put it. Um, taking all avenues, whether it's protesting, uh, holding a rally, or running for office, whatever it takes. Have you run for office? Yeah, I, I actually ran a writing campaign for state treasurer. Um, the website's still up for anybody who's interested, uh, right in ericmiller.com. Um, and, and, and that, that, that taught me a lot in its own right. Um, didn't do too much in Eastern Washington, unfortunately, because I only had, you know, six weeks from the time I decided to jump in till the time the election was. Um, but just to see how, you know, from, in terms of the democratic party from LD to LD, how different things were and and you know i went to some green party events too and so to even see how different um those events were and then there's still the intersectionality it's just so weird because it's so a lot of things are so different but so much the same um so i i really think right now we're at a a, a, a boiling point so to speak and i'm hoping that we start boiling over soon people are starting to wake up and and fight for uh themselves yeah it's interesting interesting times we're living in yeah um so so i i didn't actually did you, are do you consider yourself an activist uh, oh yeah i definitely consider i i was an activist before i was a politician i'm i mainly became and i don't even like calling myself a politician but i guess i am one um that mainly was was birthed out of activism um, I ran for office the first time 
from an activist perspective. It was more because I saw an opportunity to raise awareness about the benefits of a state bank um, and, and other issues I cared about at the time. You know, you had uh, <clears throat> the nation was finally looking and understanding that there was a problem with our criminal justice system and that innocent black men were being shot on the side of the road because their car broke down. Um, and so these these were all uh, things I wanted to speak about. And so I initially ran for office just because it gave an, an additional platform for me to talk about these issues and to raise awareness around them. Um, I, I'm an activist who happens to be involved in politics. That, there we go. I think that's, that's the way to put it. Yeah. I mean, I agree. It's, it's weird using the word politician, um, you know, uh, but um, I mean, so I have to, cause I am, I don't have, I guess I don't have to, but I'm technically an elected politician. Uh, but it is a, a word I don't really enjoy associating with my <laughs> um, because politics is such an ugly uh, business. And, you know, politicians, the type of people that are attracted to being politicians uh, up until now, have been for some reason people that enjoy or some reason attracted to the machinery of politics, which is such an ugly machinery. It's like, who would want to get involved with that? Well, and then, and then there's the, the power that's derived from gaining political office, um, that people seek also. And, uh, it's funny because I've, I've, I've had these conversations a lot. People go, okay, when are you going to run again? Because I'm a pretty vocal guy. I'm, I'm, sort of in the public eye, at least locally within Thurston County. So I get asked this all the time. And one thing I did learn from running for, for, for office for me personally was there was a lot of games I didn't want to play. There was a lot of, a lot of things that people expected of me that I didn't feel comfortable doing. Um, and it's just, for me, you have to have this certain hardened skin to be able to take the shots. Uh, um, that I don't know if I have yet. Um, and I don't know if I, I ever will have it. So right now I'm, I'm comfortable being in party leadership um, and, and just being out there on the front lines fighting as an activist uh, for the things that I believe in. Um, politics, the, the more you get into it, the more you understand it, and the more you realize that even down the small city level in an average size city like Olympia, um, there's still the games. There's still corporate money. There's still uh, people willing to put out a fake robocall uh, slandering their opponent. Uh, it's dirty, and uh, I'm not I'm not supportive of that. Um, so, kind of why I got into party leadership is hopefully we can change the game so that people don't have to play dirty in order to win seats. And I and I assume someone like you, Matt, didn't have to play dirty to get your seat. But but a, a lot of people do bow down to that. And uh, even the best people who have the best intentions um, get pressured and put in situations where they do bow down and go against their principles. And so I think it's important that we got to change the game so that people who really represent the people have an opportunity to run for office and that you don't have to be a power-hungry, um, uh, power-motivated individual. Yeah, um, it, you got you got you hit on a bunch of really interesting sort of threads there. The uh, the game of politics, um, and it's it's just so tempting to play the game. You, you with me? We have an audio issue. Can you hear me? So go thumbs up if you can hear me. Hey, we got a technical difficulty. This is really going to frustrate our vast audience of nobody who's watching us live. You might need to reconnect. Let's see. Is there a little late chat here? Can you hear me? Okay. Hey, uh, probably uh, disconnect and reconnect. Cool, now I get to gather my thoughts. 
for what I want to. Oh, I could embed the Facebook Live video if I could do it really quick here. Yeah, what has happened to my live meeting? Okay. Eric is switching to phone video. So hopefully the problem is all on his side. And um, We got it fixed. All right. Nothing like a little technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, there's a there's a reason that uh, our attorney general is suing Comcast. I think. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Um, let's see. We we're talking about playing the game of politics, and uh, uh, just because you you brought it up, you asked me if uh, you were if I had to do anything in the political game to get elected. Um, you can hear me all right? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, but I know exactly what you're talking about, feeling pressure to do things the way the game is expected to be played, um, but also pressure to uh, run for office using the exact same techniques that people tell you to use. Um, and uh, even just the pressure to talk 
and talk about issues the way they say you have to talk about issues in order to be a yeah. legitimate candidate. Um, so you feel this immediate pressure to think about your image, how your political image, and then you feel pressured by anyone trying to advise you about um, what you should say. And, but I mean, I also, of course, did you have people helping you like figure out what you were going to say in speeches and stuff like that? Well, I, no, I, I wrote my own speeches. Um, what, what I did get though was um, a lot of people would give me like feedback on my website um, hey, you shouldn't say this, or things I posted on Facebook. Hey, you shouldn't say this. Um, and I did have have different people try to pull me aside and tell me after I did give speeches, hey, you shouldn't have said that. You're being too critical of. Um, well, for instance, one I got a lot was being too critical of Hillary Clinton. Um, and so, <laughs> those kind of things, people did definitely try to sway. Yeah, you know, and I've sort of come to um, to realize that, you know, it's just sort of a spectrum of advice you get from people, whether it's, you know, on the spectrum on one side of the spectrum, see which camera I'm looking at, you know, at one side of the spectrum, there is uh, positive, it's like support and um, really, really positively presented suggestions for what you might do differently. And then... In the middle, you have sort of the um, uh, people that just constantly, are, they, they aren't mean spirited, but they, you know, they just come up and say, you shouldn't have done that. You should have done this. You should have done that. Should, you know, and they're, they're not really, they're not trying to hurt you or disrupt you, but they, they aren't really, um, they're just sort of vomiting their opinions about your behavior. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you take that for what it's worth. Um, some different people are different levels of mindful in how they share the ideas in their head with another person. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have people that are trolls, you know, that are like attacking and, um, they're saying you shouldn't have done this, you know, you're going to be, you're going to get in trouble for that. Or, um, you lost a lot of votes because you said this, or you won't wear this pins, you know, supporting this or, uh, or just attacking, you know, the what you're talking about and saying, well, you're talking about the wrong subject. You need to talk about this. So that's, you know, it's like, but it's all a spectrum of feedback, right? It just, it, it just, when you become a public figure, you get a bunch of that really nasty stuff on the nasty side of the spectrum. And you're right. It takes, you have to like learn how the heck are you going to uh, live? How are you going to respond to negative, really trollish, mean um, energy? However they send that energy your way, whether it's, and man, I could list so many different ways I've gotten negative <laughs> energy from people, you know, while in office, you know, whether it's other politicians or the public, um, it's bizarre. And I guess you do just have to get used to it. Yeah, the, the other thing I, I what, what baffled me the whole time was how critical people were of me, even though I was running against two Republicans and I was, you know, like I said, I, I only had six weeks to campaign. So my main focus was Democrats. I wasn't trying to pull in the, the, the type of race I was running. I wasn't trying to pull in Republicans. Um, I was just aiming for Democrats. I, you know, I'm running against two Republicans. I figure political strategy wise, if I just aim it at the Democrats, then, Hey, I actually have a chance. It just needs 33% when it's a three-way race. Um, excuse me, 34. But, um, the fact that there were some organizations who were more willing to endorse, and these are democratic LDs endorse one of the Republican candidates than me because I was an unknown entity to them. Um, so they were willing to be more critical of me who was, in their party uh, than someone who <laughs> was in the, the enemy uh, quote unquote party. Um, and so that was very interesting to me to the point where um, I went and spoke at one LD and I, I won't call them out in particular. 
um, but I went and spoke at one LD and in the middle of my speech, I get interrupted with someone trying to question um, my intentions and just start uh, attacking me. And, you know, I, I responded and, and made it known that they were false allegations that this woman was making. Um, and, and in defense of that LD, her LD was not on her side. They were upset that she attacked me, but it was someone who was in leadership in their LD. And so, and for those who may not know, LD would be legislative district. Um, each, each party, Republicans and Democrats have uh, legislative district organizations and county organizations. Um, and yeah, so, so they, she attacked me. And, and here I was trying to defend myself and I jumped in the race because nobody else did. I didn't, you know, uh, even two months prior to that, I had no intention of running for state treasurer. I knew I wasn't quite ready to run for a state office, but nobody else was doing it. And the, the people deserved a progressive choice. So it was just very disheartening to have people attack me when here I was um, doing something for the greater good is, is what my intentions were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the, the other aspect of the other side of, uh, I don't know why I'm going with sides as a metaphor, but another interesting observation I've made is it's not just becoming a public figure or a politician that suddenly opens you up to attacks um, like that. It's actually just speaking. So, I mean, uh, in a way, just staying, raising your hand and saying, I'm going to speak or I'm going to write a letter to the editor um, is opens yourself up to that, you know, to public attack from you don't know where because you're putting an, you're saying something and your audience is broader than you can see. And so you don't and suddenly you might get attacked from you don't know what direction like that woman at that meeting. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, I think that's the reason people uh, have been so uh, uninterested in becoming activists and over the years is because pe people know it opens yourself up to attack. No one likes conflict. No one's likes pain. So for a lot of people stay out of the political fray or have stayed out of the political activist fray, which sort of brings us to this moment where people are coming out of the woodwork. I mean, it is like, like you said, at boiling over. I have, we are living in such crazy times. I mean, the, the, I mean, not just, um, I mean, the woman's March, uh, women are riled up and, and becoming activists in this country. Like, like I've never seen before in my lifetime, but it's, it's going all the way through the federal government. I mean, entire departments, the national park service, NASA, I mean, it's in the federal government, there is a rebellion like happening. I mean, people are, uh, so many people are willing to say, um, you know, I don't care if this has consequences for my job and my income. I'm going to do something, take a stand, say no to power. And it's, it's surreal. Well, we, we look at the last election and here you have the, uh, most disliked candidate of all time becoming a president. Um, and instantly the stock for spray on tan goes up too. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's so interesting because I think the people are realizing that there's not as much, I, I, don't get me wrong. I, I always say, and, and it's kind of a cliche thing for activists and, um, people involved in activism to say that the people have the power we still do have the power in some sense because you see things like Standing Rock. We, we you know, we forced Obama to eventually um, side with the activists on that. Um, you see the, the Occupy Wall Street movement. And, and even though that was disbanded, you see that, you know, the sort of activist movements that are going on now are kind of like the grandchildren or whatever, of, or children of the Occupy movement. Um, and you see the Bernie Sanders revolution. You see all this stuff happening, um, and it's because the people are realizing, wait, hold up. So you're going to give me, and, and I'm a Democrat, so people are going to give me crap when I talk like this, but you're going to give me Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, and, and, and these are my choices, and 
now that you they see it right on their TV screen, it's not a conspiracy theory. This is what's happening. Everybody hates these two, but somehow this is what we're stuck with. Um, and, and people are starting to realize, wow, they, they are just running everything. Um, it has become an oligarchy. And what's funny to me is, is even four or five years ago, if you were talking about the government being an oligarchy, then, oh, man, you're crazy. You got a Jen Foyle hat on, and now you have maybe the most popular political figure in the country, Bernie Sanders, who drops words like oligarchy and socialism um, and things that you wouldn't even dare say as a politician five years ago, they're acceptable now. Um, and, and that's because uh, people are waking up and people are realizing, man, I got to do something. Um, and I, I think the, the thing that's happening the most is, and, and this sucks uh, because, you know, the marginalized communities have been feeling affected for, you know, decades. And, uh, but, but now you see the, the middle class um, white person is, is becoming affected too. And so they're finally saying, oh, wait, now you're affecting my life also. You're not just affecting their lives. And they're starting to realize, oh, we're not so different. We're all, we all are human beings and we all are getting smashed by these corporate bullies and this isn't fair. And there, there's an interesting thing when you look at the end of uh, feudalism and how capitalism even started as a thing is what happened is you had a, the, um, oh man, I'm going to get the terms mixed up, the serfs and the lords and they were the only ones who could really make a living. And so then you had, and, and you had to be a, a Roman Catholic in order to inherit any kind of land or any kind of legacy. So then you had, you know, Muslims and gypsies and uh, even Protestants who had no chance at surviving in England uh, in those times. And so that's how capitalism even became a thing. So, you know, what we call a merchant today, people would go to uh, a different area and buy a product and travel 50, 100 miles and sell that product for double the amount so they can make a living. And, and you see that happening now. We're kind of making our own societies. We're kind of banding together. And we're showing the government that, hey, if you're not going to work for us, we're going to work against you. Um, and we're going to create our own society. And I think we're in the very early stages and maybe not, maybe not in my lifetime and your lifetime, Matt, but I think I think we're setting the stage for a, a big paradigm shift. Um, and I think right now we're molding that paradigm shift. And I think it's a, a great responsibility to have. And although we might not see the shift completely take place, we're definitely the ones that are pointing that shift in the direction that, uh, of revolution. Yeah, I, I totally hear you there. Um, I think things are... Uh, Things are changing. You know, the, the crystal has been cracked on the, the, the stagnant state of this country, and it's been cracked on the complacency of so many people. And what I sort of find myself watching is as millions of people are getting like, uh, are, are renting themselves out of their homes and going to their first protest, and going to their first democratic meeting or their first political party meeting and talking on Facebook like crazy, you know, <laughs> like they, you know, friends I've had who had no interest really in Occupy are, are now like, you know, engaging in political debate on Facebook. But what I, I find myself really looking at is just like with the Occupy movement, how do we channel this energy to make a substantive change? And I don't, you know, it's just like, I would start with one. What is like one substantive change we want in our world? And if I, I think we need to think about that because it's so easy for the energy to be channeled into pretty, uh, maybe uh, pretty kind of worthless areas. Like, like uh, like hating Donald Trump, you know, just like, yeah. um, or hate, you know, and, and demonizing your enemy. It's like, that is like, 
that is the pathway to nowhere, demonizing your enemy. You know, the pathway to fixing anything is making allies. And the better you are at making allies with people that you don't like, the more allies you'll have and the more change you can actually make. Um, but uh, I, I see this, the energy is like, it's going everywhere right now. And some people, they don't realize, you know, a lot of people that um, are leaders that talk a lot, they don't, I don't think they realize how they're, chan you know, they could be helping us channel the energy into actual change, uh, but they channel into sort of, you know, war and uh, sort of enemy talk. But where do you think the energy should be channeled? Where do you want to, what substantive change do you think we should do? Well, I think, I mean, there, there's so much, <laughs> there's so many changes that need to happen. And I think that's, Pick one. that's, oh man. Well, I think the one thing right now is getting money out of politics. Um, and I don't want to say that any of the other issues aren't important, but I think it'll be a lot easier to solve the other issues um, and get get that that shift in the change that we want done once uh, our politicians aren't, aren't funded by corporations and going back to something that we kind of talked about in the beginning once money's out of politics that's when the diverse voices and the people who want to run for office that do represent um, the people of our country can run for office because they don't need the corporate money. And then you start seeing true representation of the people and you see more diversity in politics. And, and, and the other thing I think that needs to happen is the Democratic Party, if it really wants to continue being the party of the working class and the party of the people, it needs to become an activism party also. It needs to, uh, engage more in protest it, the the party itself obviously there's a lot of intersectionality between activism and people involved in the politics but the party has to come out and say we support these protests we support this action we support this rally and even on another level we need to go out and and actually help the community instead of just giving it lip service we need to volunteer at food banks. We need to go hand out backpacks to the homeless. Um, we need to go uh, fix the garden of a senior citizen who won't be able to do it on their own. Um, this is what needs to happen. We need to become a community again. Um, and, and something else you brought up was, was not hating the enemy. And I think that's so important because I've talked to a lot of Trump voters and to be honest, uh, my mom and my stepdad, they are Trump voters. And so I, I know firsthand um, and I don't hear from them. Oh, I hate Mexicans. Oh, I hate Muslims. That's not what I hear from them. I hear nobody's been working for me. Hillary Clinton represented everything that I was against. And although I might not, not necessarily like Donald Trump, he's better than she was. That, that's what I hear from them. I don't hear this, you know, there was this passion for Bernie. I don't see that same passion for Trump. Obviously there's people out there who do have that passion for him, but nowhere near the same level. It was, you know, we always talk about voting for the lesser of two evils. Well, they just happened to think he was the lesser of two evils. It's not that they were full throatedly uh, supporting him. And so I think it's important we need to understand our brothers and sisters because just because they voted differently than us doesn't mean that they don't face um, struggles and that they don't have trials and tribulations. They're hurting too. Um, and so I, I like that you said, don't hate the enemy. That, that, that's not constructive. But what we need to fight against is, you know, oligarchy. Um, we need to fight against a uh, divisiveness. Um, it's more important for us come together uh, than it is to separate ourselves further. Yeah. All right. So there's two threads. I, I want to jump in there. Um, the, how do we come together? Um, how does, what does that look like? And, uh, and specifically with the get the money out of politics, um, what specifically, like what could we do? I mean, what would be, 
one action, one change that could be done by law or by whatever to get the money out of politics. Um, and the, the how to come together, how do we actually organize um, is sort of another thread we can, uh, we can explore. But why don't we, I don't know, either one of those. Which one of those do you want to jump on? Well, to, we'll, we'll start with the first one. Um, you know, there's, there's an organization that uh, TYT, the, the news, the YouTube news channel kind of sponsors um, called Wolfpack. Um, and their strategy is a, is a pretty good one uh, to get states to ratify amendments. Um, and what, what, if we get two thirds of the states um, to ratify an amendment, then it becomes part of the constitution. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's that's one strategy. The the other strategy, um, and we've kind of been doing this, is just organizing. And again, that kind of leads into the next part: is how how do we come together? Um, and I talked about this a lot during my campaign, also, because what's important is to uh, come together on the things we agree on. We talk too much about what we disagree on, um, and, and and that's kind of natural. You know, I don't have anything to argue with with you about. Then then how's that interesting? It's kind of like a mindset that that's been out there, and it's the wrong mindset. We we need to think about what what affects you, Matt, that also affects me, and how can we together change that? Um, not not what do I disagree with you on, Matt? It's what do we agree on? And I think understanding that each and every one of us has some sort of an intersectionality on some sort of issue is what's important. You might be um, a, a Southern hardcore Republican, but I guarantee you there's still one issue I agree with you on. Um, and so those are the types of things we need to look at is, is what do we agree on, not what do we disagree on, the, the divisiveness has got to end. So I think coming together first starts with understanding, number one, that we're all human beings. Number two, um, that there's things that affect us all. And number three, how can we work together to affect a change? Um, and it, it's, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, and, and you brought up with the Occupy movement that there was no real direction to take an action. and Right now, there's so much energy, and this movement, yeah, there's kind of like, you know, your Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren um, or Keith Ellison or whoever people may look up to, Nina Turner, Jill Stein, um, but, but what's, what, I, what I think is a little different is there isn't some main leader. We, we kind of have, are learning to organize within our own communities. So it's how do we get the communities to organize with other communities and how, you know, you saw with the Women's March, I saw people go, man, I didn't even know this was happening. And suddenly millions of people across the country are marching right now together. How do we, how do we do that? How do we get everybody to march on the same day, you know, in Seattle and Boston and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Austin, Texas and Cheyenne, Wyoming how do we get everybody on the same day to do the same action? That, that's what's important. And, you know, social media, I think that's so key to this generation. And, and I think that's a huge reason why, why we're seeing a different kind of uprising is not only is information spreading faster, um, but we're able to all connect. And I also suspect that the powers that be are, are, are also realizing that. And uh, we're going to see a tax on that as well, I think, within the, you know, the very, very near future. And that neutrality is another huge issue um, in that regard. Okay. So the idea that I'm going to like, I'm going to, I think we're just going to explore a little bit. I mean, it's an obvious one. It's not new, but I think it's a good one for us to focus on is the constitutional amendment idea because if you think about it if we simply got all enough people in this country to just realize if we just agree on what amendment we want if we have enough people we can literally just change the constitution 
we can, you just need a certain percentage of the, I don't know if it's the state legislatures or whatever, but um, it's really just people. You know, if we, if we the people just realize we control the constitution and if we just take control of the constitution, then um, that's the law of the land. I mean, that controls literally everything. Um, so why don't we, it gives me this idea, why don't you and I play a little game right now? We're going to play okay. Matt and Eric amend the Constitution. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see if you and I can agree. If we could amend the Constitution right now, you know, in broad terms, is there an amendment you'd like to throw in there? And really, we can have fun with it, whatever, and we'll see if we can agree. And if we had a live audience, they could participate and start posting amendments. But uh, they haven't caught up with the amazing fun they could have with this show yet and the platform <laughs> building which could actually help us amend the constitution but anyways let's do it do you uh do you have an amendment you'd like in the constitution eric you have 10 seconds <laughs> yes i would like to amend the constitution to say that corporate money is not the same as people's free speech <laughs> that should solve it all so corporate money uh, I mean, it's basically like the money is not speech. Money, exactly. Money is not. It's speech. not. It's yeah. bribery. That's what it is. Okay, I'm with you on that one. So that's one down. Money is not speech. How about? I mean, we just add on to that just for clarification. You know, this is this would be my recommendation. Just to be clear, uh, corporations are not people. Yep. <laughs> They are not human beings. They do not have any rights unless those rights are specified in this constitution under this amendment. And maybe some that, anyways, maybe that would take us to like talk about what rights corporations actually have. That would be a fun thing. Corporation bill of rights written by the people saying you have the right to, you know, do stuff that we let you do until we don't let you do it anymore. Something like that. What? Sorry to interject here and change it up a little bit, but what, what else has always been interesting to me is how, you know, the Supreme Court gave corporations the same right as a person, but does a person have the same rights as a corporation? Sorry. I've just thought of that one quite a few times because uh, – it doesn't. It doesn't work both ways. It's. It, they don't. They didn't give it a two-way street, and that just to me shows me how much. Uh, I, I. I still don't understand how Citizens United happened. Um, but I think another amendment um, that I'd like to have would be that uh, every person that lives in the United States of America has the right to vote, with or without an ID. <laughs> Without an ID, they don't need an ID. If you're above the age of 18, you have the right to vote. Yeah, I mean, just put into the Constitution some form of, you know, um, yeah, just set the voter ID by the Constitution uh, at the federal level. I think that's great. I'm with you on that. So that's the third, third amendment we got because we got corporations are not people, money is not speech, and people can vote without IDs. And I uh, will go ahead. How about uh, corporations will pay their fair share of taxes? I would just set the tax rate for corporations by the amendment and we'll change it when we feel like it. Like we set it at, you know, it's just like the tax on corporations shall be this. We just, we just said, I don't know what it is right now. Cause it's like every different corporate industry has their own little tax rate that they've negotiated in the back rooms of Congress and on the golf courses, but we could just set it by constitutional amendment. Every corporation pays this amount of taxes if they have a revenue over like, I don't know, $5 million a year. Like How that. about every, every human being has the right to free healthcare and free education. And we can elaborate on those things also. If we needed to. Yeah. Well, that would be the fun part of the discussion is like, what level of health care, you know, what should be the tax that people pay to get health care? 
And what right. level of education do we give people for free? Do we go to um, through college? Did you hear about Tennessee has actually made a community college? They have a bill to make community college free to all people in Tennessee. Wow. Yeah, I mean, Tennessee leading the charge in free education. Yeah, well, that's kind of uh, backwards. Uh, Washington hasn't done it yet, you know. <laughs> All right, I got another amendment for you. I like, I'm with you on the healthcare and education one. Might need to wordsmith that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> but I got another one. You ready for this? This is going to blow yeah, your yeah. off. Supreme Court justices, uh, something about like, um, one, if we don't like the way these Supreme Court justices are going, we could say, you know, we could actually set a date that like in – 2019, all Supreme Court justices will be retired and there will be uh, national elections for the new Supreme Court justice or something, you know, just selected by the... Oh, oh. <laughs> yes. I love it. The Supreme Court would be like, oh, and then we'd, I bet they get like some sort of like income for life or something if they retire and we could like just slice that out. We could say, and the current justices don't get any, you know, guaranteed income, just like put them on the street. Go back to work. Go be a, a lawyer or something. Is there even a progressive Supreme Court justice? I know there's Democrats, you know, but they all seem a little bit on the corporatist side. Oh, they they all are on the – I mean, the, the history of how corporations got the same rights as people is really long, and these guys have been studying the law of the land – you know, their entire careers. And I don't think any of them are radically really questioning the legal status of corporations in this country. So how about another amendment that uh, they will, uh, the United States government will forever and always completely 100% respect sovereign land to indigen of, of indigenous peoples. Oh man, yeah, some, some sort of amendment that clarifies the status of these treaties. I mean, we could basically, I mean, heck, I mean, we could open up treaties that we know the U.S. has violated, you know, and um, yeah, I mean, rectify it through a, a massive national, like, dialogue about how to really, you know, work with our sovereign nations that are within our borders. Yeah. Or even to to elaborate on that more, uh, create an entire truth and reconciliation kind of commission um, for not only um, people whose ancestors were slaves, but but also people whose ancestors uh, were in the uh, Japanese internment camps. Um, which, you know, they didn't like to call it that back then, but that's really what they were. I mean, they were, I mean, I, I actually have family who was very, very far off. Uh, well, not that far off. It was my grandpa's family um, were in a uh, Japanese internment camp in Colorado. And, uh, but uh, yeah, a truth and reconciliation commission for, for all the, different peoples that our government has done wrong in its history from the indigenous Americans um, whose land they stole uh, all the way to the slaves that they brought here. Um, and then the people that they, they wrongly imprisoned during um, world war two. I like it. I don't know if we call it truth and reconciliate. I mean, that's, that's probably better. Um, I like that reconciliation. I was going to say it's like restitution is another word, but you know, yes is a tool you use to help with reconciliation. So I like, I like that truth and reconciliation. A department of truth and reconciliation, the U S department of truth and reconciliation. <laughs> there you go. And, and, you know, we need to help these people because, because we ignore their history. Yeah. You know, we, we have black history month, but we, we should be helping create museums because really this nation was, that's who really built this nation. Well, some fat cat rich corporate bullies, which is kind of how it's always been, got to sit in an office somewhere um, and reap the benefits of 
the sweat and tears and blood of um, people who are wrongly enslaved. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, we got six constitutional, at least six constitutional amendments in there. Uh, you know, it's like problem solved. If, if the country would just participate in this discussion between you and I, and maybe just trusted you and I to, to put these kinds these, <laughs> they just what got behind these. I mean, it'd be, they're, they're poorly written. You know, they're, they're not really well thought out and they are better than what our U S our president has done the first, you know, 14 days in office and they're better written than his executive orders, I think. So, yeah, I think so too. I, I, this one might be a little crazy, but another one I would add is, is some sort of basic income or a basic welfare, something universal. Basic um, income. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off there. You have more to say about that. No, no, no. I, I, I just mean even if it's not cash per se, even if everybody's guaranteed, you know, housing and food and healthcare and education, and it's not necessarily cash, sure. Oh, but like those are, you know, shelter, uh, food, heat. I mean, those are all things that should just be basic human rights, in my opinion. They should not be luxuries. Yeah, and it's not like some. Yeah, I'm with you there, uh, and it's not like people have to be guaranteed a mansion, you know. Right. If we could do mansions for everyone, I would. I mean, if we could do it, I'd vote for it, sure. But I think <laughs> maybe in the days when we get to the Star Trek universe, when we have replicators, we can do that. But you know, basic housing, uh, basic food, you know, again, doesn't have to be filet mignon, and just be like basic level of food guaranteed minimal level of health care and education um yeah and you know what i would do i would give this is a total tangent but i would give kids in school more options for like i mean if they you know it's like i feel like it's a waste to push a kid through school if he's like or he or she doesn't want to do it and is not doing it like you know broaden the the options for educational energy you know like vocational type stuff yeah well whatever I, I think that's one of the things that frustrates me about investing in anything if you're investing in something and people are just sitting in there wasting it and making it worse because they're not helping it then i want to like take their energy and move it somewhere that it'll be healthy um, right anyways total tangent there all right, let's, let's stop with the amendments because we've got it basically figured out. The world would be a much better place if we had these. these uh, now I think we're up to seven nice amendments. But how are we going to do this? How do we get the entire enough people in the USA to come together to join this conversation and debate the seven amendments that are going to change this country? Well, the quickest way would to get uh, anonymous to uh, hack Comcast and let Matt and I take over the airwaves. <laughs> that, that would be I mean, really quick. That would, that's sort of like from V for Vendetta. That's kind of what he did. Over, did you watch? You seen that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen it. I love that movie. Okay. So your suggestion uh, is to take over mass media uh, by hijacking it. So what if we change that to just say we take over mass media, but we don't do it in an illegal way? We just create a new form of mass media that takes over because it's just better it's more fun and it's people powered right yeah i actually think we see that happening right now you have you know like tyt um even rt is pretty big democracy now you are seeing independent media starting to slowly take off and and what's happening too is is now even like cnn is trying to do their own kind of like independent media um, that's more scaled down and, and not as professional looking. So, you know, they're, they're just trying to pretend that they're independent media. Um, the internet, I mean, that's the way it's going. That's very possible. That's one way to do it. Social media is another tool. Um, we need to have regional organizing teams. We need some kind of organization and, and uh, 
I've seen some organizations kind of start trying to do stuff like this too. Um, but we need regional organizing teams where statewide or even, even if we get down to counties, um, and that way, you know, we could just do on a, on a dime, Hey, six hours from now, everybody hit the streets. We need to, with the 24 hour news cycle, um, it's not even 24 hours anymore. It's more like four hours, but we need to be able to act like that. We need to be able to act on a, on a, just the snap of the fingers. Um, that's the way to do it. I think is, is through, you know, having small organizations that kind of feed into a bigger organization that helps do the, the, the bureaucratic type stuff. Um, and, and we at the local level can do the organizing type stuff. Um, we just need a network, some kind of network. So how do we, um, I'm, I'm totally with you here. And I'm, I, it's like, I mean, it's basically just talking about connection. It's connecting the people in a way that, like you said, um, we can act as one when we need to act as one, and we can focus and talk about one topic when we need to focus and talk about one topic, you know, and make decisions together. And so, I mean, it's basically connection. And like, and this is something I've thought a lot about, but like, you know, I think it just starts with one connection. You know, and once you have, and once you know this is the right type of connection, this is the right level of power, this is exactly what we need connecting two people, then you just add more people to that. And now you, and eventually you add everyone because if it's right, if the connection is right, then people will want to join it. They'll want to participate. They'll see the actions that this connected group of people are doing. It's very tricky though. Um, once you have 10 or 20 or 100 people connected together, the, the tricky part is it becomes a power struggle in the organization. And that turns, and a power struggle invites, you know, power mongers and ego. And, and so this is something I've thought a lot about. Um, and, and really the, the site that I've built is all about this, but, but we can come back to that. But I was gonna suggest, if you, if you like this premise, two people could start this. How could you and I start it? How could we have, what kind of connection do you and I need to have so that we, um, we have the, you know, the right connected tools that we could add, you know, just keep adding people to our, our, uh, our connected network. I mean, what is miss? Do we have already what we need to work together to build this network? I think we do. And going back to, you were talking about like, eliminating the desire for power within these networks. I think what, what could solve that is instead of, instead of having somebody lead at the top, you have a uh, little organizations that all have the same name and, um, you know, I don't know what name it would be. And each County elects, you know, someone, and you call them a lead organizer. That's, that's what they'd be called because that's not necessarily a term that would make someone think, oh, you're given power. They're given power. They're just, you know, they're a lead organizer. And you limit how much, you know, and it also makes the organizing easy um, when you have your lead organizer in each county um, within a state. And the lead organizers, have conference calls once a week from each county for each state. And then from each state, you might have a lead organizer or, or a uh, not even, you wouldn't want to call them that you, you'd call them a state liaison. So they would talk to other state liaisons that would be on those state conference calls and they can all talk about, well, this is what we're doing in our state. Um, and that kind of takes away the positions of power because you're having lead organizers in each county and then you're just electing someone to talk to the other states as like a state liaison um so they're not really given a position of power they're just given a position of communication um 
or you can even call them the state communicator or something. I don't know. Um, but how could we do this now? I mean, look at us right now. You're what, a, a two and a half hour drive away from me, but yet we're having a video conference. Um, there's a lot, I think there is a, a, a free or low cost infrastructure that could already be utilized. Um, you know, from Skype and Google Hangouts to Facebook groups to um, Signal to, uh, I mean, whatever whatever form. They even have fire chat where you can just use Bluetooth where you don't even need to use phone networks. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it. It just takes the effort, I think, and getting people to get the infrastructure set. But I think there's free or low-cost ways to get an entire national organization running. I mean, really, it, if you already know somebody with some server space and somebody to build a website, you could start a national organization tomorrow. Yeah, I guess um, I'm totally, I'm totally uh, with the idea of connecting masses of people um, I wonder if a uh, if an organization is the word for what um, the no story. that's the wrong word I mean I could imagine I used it but it's not proper yeah I mean like like during the Occupy uh, movement you know we had general assemblies you know these open general assemblies anyone could join and they were all over the country and they were just like um, in theory facilitated by consensus I felt like that could have evolved into uh, what we need as a country and, I, and like in Spain I think their general assemblies have they've actually formalized them they've, they've like made these like community assemblies I believe uh, part of their political machinery, um, but uh, there's there's reasons why the Occupy General Assemblies did not evolve into that, and um, and that's sort of like sort of you know the fact that they didn't has sort of been like the problem I've been sort of meditating on and studying for since the Occupy movement kind of stopped. Um, I also think even the word Occupy, the Occupy brand became uh, a barrier to those general assemblies evolving into what they needed to evolve into, you know, because it was almost like, I mean, you couldn't call it, you know, it can't be a Democratic Party thing. It can't be a Republican Party thing. It's, it's almost like once you slap a, a brand name of some sort onto a movement uh, of people, it's like, you're immediately alienating some people, unless it's a very carefully chosen word. You know, I think maybe people's assemblies, you know, was one, uh, you know, for a while I thought maybe that was it. A people's assembly. If we could figure out a way to have people's, uh, open people's assemblies and communities all over the country and a way to connect them all. Um, and it, but it literally had to welcome everyone. It had to welcome right wing, left wing, socialist, yeah. uh, whatever, capitalist, and um, and it, it seems that's sort of my sense is the the way to go. And that's and that's what I'm kind of I'm trying to do with my uh, my software. You know, it's built to do um, open assemblies. Anyone can join and participate in an egalitarian manner and. Um, and we're doing one you know, you're totally invited to come to the first one on, on, uh, February 16th and that's next week, uh, or participate over video like this. Um, but I mean, that's, it's basically, I'm, I'm trying to plug into that sort of, uh, that sort of idea of community assemblies using technology to help facilitate it. Um, but I, 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 you know, I don't know how, I don't know the steps, I don't know really how it's going to evolve. I don't really know the steps to take, but go ahead. It's interesting. It's interesting. Cause I don't, I don't know, uh, 
you were talking about you developed a software called Hive. Um, but that's kind of where we need what we need to grow is is we need to think like a hive. And I don't know if you did that purposely, but <laughs> but we do. We need to we need to think like a hive where we we just work together regardless of if you're a worker bee or the queen bee, we need to work like a hive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, like you said, though, a hive in nature, I think it tends to have a pretty strict hierarchy. It has a monarch, this queen. <laughs> but, um, sure. but it does, but I think in principle, that is basically the best metaphor I could come up with. Other than network, I mean, just your word network is another sort of good, uh, yeah. We need to be networked, but a hive sort of gives it, it's like a, a living network of beings. And I think it should be as egalitarian as possible. It should be, um, and it, yeah, I think we have to really look at how power works, you know, and as we start organizing, I mean, if, if you and I, say you and I started, um, you know, talking about this uh, and we had like 50 people join and we were talking on a regular basis, we would immediately have to start thinking about who's in charge of the conversation, who is choosing the topic, who's choosing who gets to speak. And that is, that is very delicate stuff. You make bad decisions there, people will feel it, you know, they'll feel it. Um, I mean, this is something, another sort of thing I've been sort of learning, uh, you know, cause you and I, uh, as far as I can tell, we're both white males and, you know, so we're used to all our life being um, very easy to have our voice heard in any group, any circle of people. In fact, um, I don't know about you, but I often, it's almost like um, I'm expected to, to speak or take uh, leadership. You can sort of feel that sometimes from people. Yeah. Like less so these days, but but it's, it's really taught me to, um, to think about the, the structures in place during a meeting and try to figure out how to make them as egalitarian as possible to make it maximum safety. And it kind of comes all the way back to what we were talking about at the beginning. If you don't have that safety, you will have uh, trauma. You will have attacks and you will have pain because people will attack each other. I have a friend, yeah. I have a friend who's talking about like um, Al-Anon meetings, and they have very strict rules in Al-Anon meetings where you are not supposed to ever comment on other people's statements. You know, it's like people talk about what what they're going through, but it's like such a breach of protocol to be like, you did the wrong thing there, you know, or you you should have done this, or you should, and, and doing whatever commentary on their their thing. Um, but I kind of feel like we might need to uh, to do to figure out a way to grow this like hive of humanity. We've got to like build a culture of communicating that is more aware of, of power and um, and space. And res yeah, and, and and respecting each other um, as equals, I think yeah. is very important too. Could you imagine having a meetup? where this was attempted to happen a positive facilitation, but it had both Trump and anti-Trump people in the room. I mean, can you imagine participating in that and for it not to blow up into a fist fight? <laughs> I, I can't imagine it. I could hope for it though. Yeah. I, I, although that sounds like my Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> But what if you were there to talk about? I assume at Thanksgiving you guys tried to not talk about it too much. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. At Christmas, <laughs> there was a sign on the door: "No politics." Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I'm. I'm like. I actually. <laughs> uh, Linda Smith was a um, conservative politician in Washington State, and she's actually my mom's cousin. So. Um, it, it it definitely runs politics runs in my family um on both sides so <laughs> it's very interesting at times yeah yeah I'm, I'm literally i'm like scared of trying to host a public 
discussion or even an online discussion where Trump and non-Trump uh, supporters participate. I, I just, I try to talk to people and um, they're literally insane with anger. Um, so, but I think that's what we have to figure out a way to do that. Cause I mean, it's, if we could figure out a way for the Trump supporters in this country and the non-Trump supporters to just figure out their common ground, cause there is common ground. I bet you, yeah. I bet you 80 to 90% of this country would agree with, um, get the money out of politics and corporations are not people. Um, I bet those two amendments, I mean, if we literally, literally could just tell everyone, don't talk about anything else. The only thing we're talking about are substantive actions to change this country. And we're going to focus on the ones that there's the most agreement on. I mean, like, like we were saying, we control the constitution. We could change the constitution to yeah. control this country by the people. If we just stopped arguing with each other about, you know, Trump is nasty to women. Yes. Let's move. I mean, it's true. That's, and that's an important area. Um, it's a horrible, horrible, uh, I agree. It's, it's horribly unpleasant the way, um, he talks about some people, but I don't want to talk about people's character flaws. I want to talk about how do we fix the country? And exactly. We have lots of people with lots of terrible character flaws in positions of power that we you know we need to work with in some way to change things. Or we need to take control of the country and just change it ourselves in totally. the constitution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Once, once we can get over, uh, once we can get over the character flaws and arguing over the unimportant things and, and focus on the things that we all think are important. I bet you a lot of those amendments people, people would agree with. Yeah. From both sides of the aisle. Yeah. And I think, and then can you imagine how much fun the country would suddenly have if we just realized we had control of this ship? It's like, yep. decide anything. We just come up with the idea and talk about it, explore it. And then we just pass it. And suddenly our politicians are tools just doing, you're running the machine that we're designing, you know? Exactly. And that's, that's how it should be. Yeah. All right, man. So we've, uh, we've gone past our hour limit. Are you still good? There's a little tangent we could go on if you're, if you're feeling adventurous. Or uh, you... I think I, I, I hate to be the, the party pooper, but okay. I do got to get, get real one here. All right. Well, let's do it. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything you want to say to uh, the, the vast audience um, before you leave? Uh, just, I think it's very important to remember that the power is in the hands of the people. We just have to use it. Awesome. And do you have any, um, a Twitter or anything like that you want to tell people about? Um, Twitter is, let's see, at EM, M as in mom, uh, Project Sanity, I believe. I hope I did that right. That's all right. You can, I'll post it in the description if you you know, uh, so we make sure we get that right. All right. Sounds good to me. All right, Eric. Thank you so much. Um, great talking to you. Thanks for yeah, your, you too. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Right. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye.